Thy servant, whom I uphold my chosen, in whom my soul delights, I have put my spirit upon him, and he will bring forth justice to the nations. He will not cry or lift up his voice or make it heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break. A dimly burning wick he will not quench. He will faithfully bring forth justice. He will not grow faint or be crushed until he has established justice in the earth and the coastlands wait for his teaching. Thus says God, the Lord, who created the heavens and stretched them out and who spread out the earth and what comes from it, who gives breath to the people upon it and spirit to those who walk in it. I am the Lord. I have called you in righteousness. I have taken you by the hand and kept you. I have given you as a covenant to my people and a light to my nations, and light to the nations, to open the eyes that are blind, to bring out the prisoners from the dungeon, from the prison, those who sit in darkness. I am the Lord. That is my name. My glory I give to no other, nor my praise to idols. See, the former things have come to pass, and the new things I now declare before they spring forth. I tell you of them. Are you familiar with the cartoon Coyote and the Roadrunner? The Wiley Coyote? Meep, meep, Roadrunner? Huh? Wouldn't you love it just once to see the coyote catch that little bird? <laughs> How many times have you fantasized since you were four years old? Just what you would like to see happen if that box from Acme actually gave him the coyote what he needed to catch that pesky meep meep roadrunner. Ah. Oh. I shall not share it with you because you'll see my dark side and you'll never listen to me again. When I was growing up, we had a little dog named Gertrude. Gertrude lived with us through my adolescence and my young adulthood. I got her when I was 12, and Gertrude passed on to doggy heaven when I was 24. And Gertrude was what you call an indoorsy dog. She wasn't much of a hunter. She never chased anything other than food, right? Well, it came to be that we moved to South Georgia to a town that I unfortunately called Albany. It's spelled A-L-B-A-N-Y. And when I shared with the people in South Georgia that I really like Albany, they corrected me immediately and said, Albany is in New York, Albany is in Georgia. <laughs> so in Albany, Georgia, we had a house with a really nice big yard. And there was a huge oak tree on this side of the yard, and there was a huge oak tree on this side of the yard. And in our house, in our family room, was this wonderful picture window that was low enough to the floor that a dachshund could sit there and walk out the window to hunt squirrels. And Gertrude, who had always been indoorsy and was a little overweight, trimmed down quickly. When she saw a squirrel outside, she had to go out, we'd let her out, and we'd all stand at the window and watch. And she would chase a squirrel, and it would go up the tree, and about the time she was looking, another one would come down and go to the other, she would chase it, and then they would do this with her, back and forth until she just collapsed in the middle of the trees. <laughs> until one day, this is a Roadrunner Coyote moment, until one day, as she spied out the window, she saw a familiar gray form there in the grass. She had to go out. We let her out the door, and she quickly walked up, and she stopped, and guess what she did? She pointed. Really? Where did she learn that? She's not a hunting dog. She pointed, and she walked, stopped, and pointed. She got lower to the ground, got closer and closer, stopped, pointed. She could not believe that this familiar gray-looking figure, and the grass was not moving and going anywhere. She finally got about two feet away. She squatted down, and she looked at it, and then she pounced, and she caught it. She caught a mouthful of moss, tree moss. 
A mouth full of tree moss, the great red hunter, <laughs> captured her prey. And don't tell me dogs don't have feelings. She, if you could see embarrassment, she had it all. Oh, my God, I hope nobody saw that. Jeez. And so when Gertrude finally got revenge on the squirrel, all she found was she had caught an illusion. She, like Don Quixote, was chasing windmills, right? And that's the way revenge works, is it not? When you put all your energy in creating justice, you wronged me and I'm going to do whatever it takes to get you back. And sometimes when we succeed, we just look there in our disillusionment that it doesn't feel as good as we thought it was going to. In this passage today, it's all about justice. And when we think of the justice of God, what do we typically do? Usually this, right? Because there's a whole bunch of smoting going on in the Bible. It seemed that God's way of creating justice in the Old Testament was to smote you. So it would be wise for us, if we believe that, to wear hard hats to church because we don't want God bonging us in the head. Typically, when we think of justice, we think of justice as there are bad people that we are powerless to overcome, therefore God must intervene and do something horrible to the bad people so that the righteous can continue to live in peace. It is, and that's typically what justice is for us, is it not? Justice. Bad people getting their do. Doris Kearns Goodwin, if you've not read any of her books, read them. She's a wonderful historical writer. It's like reading a novel rather than reading history. She came out with a book about Abraham Lincoln, Team of Rivals. I mean, if you, some of you have read it. A lot of you probably saw the movie, Lincoln, which Steven Spielberg did, which was based upon this book. And what I loved about the movie and Daniel Day-Lewis is that they, he took that figure that we see at the Washington Memorial that's bigger than life and cut in, in marble and made him human and flesh. He was charming and witty. He had, loved to tell stories, and he was kind of folksy, but he was brilliant. And he was leading our nation in a time of civil war, abolition, and I dare say there has ever been a president in our history who was able to do what he was able to do, given the circumstances that he was in. And he had to use everybody around him to do it. But here's the kicker. He was sensitive to the fact that the South thought God was on their side and the North thought God was on their side. And Southern preachers were able to interpret the Bible literally to support slavery. God is on our side, thus saith the word, because look, look here at what it says. You see, I can talk southern. I grew up in it. <laughs> Slaves, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling. Ephesians 5. Let all who are under the yoke of slavery regard their masters as worthy of all honor. 1 Timothy 6.1 Tell slaves to be submissive to their masters and to give satisfaction in every respect. Titus 2.9 Slaves, accept the authority of your masters with all deference, not only to those who are kind and gentle, but also those who are harsh. 1 Peter 2.18 See, you can use the Bible to prove anything. And all of these scripture passages came from the epistles. Did you hear any from the Gospels? No. But because of that, the Bible says it, I believe it, and that settles it mentality. The South knew that God was on their side. This is a righteous cause for state rights. But the North felt that their cause was just too. And when you look at the brutal reality of the Civil War, you had to believe that somehow you were doing the right thing. And one of my favorite lines, the movie is one of Abraham Lincoln's competitor, or, uh, colleagues 
said to him, we're going to win this war. We have to win this war because God is on our side. And Lincoln said, I'm not concerned about whether or not God's on our side. I'm concerned about whether or not we're on the side of God because God is always right. And then he had his second inaugural address, which many historians believe was greater than his Gettysburg address. And I just want to share with you a few things that he said. Being compassionate to both the North and the South, all the places, all the states, and all the people of the United States of America, he said, both read the same Bible and pray to the same God. And each invokes his aid against the other. It may seem strange that any men should dare to ask a just God's existence and wringing their bread from the sweat of, another men's, of other men's faces. But let us not judge that we be not judged. The prayers of both could not be answered. That of neither has been answered fully. The Almighty has his own purposes. And then later in his speech he says, Fondly do we hope, fervently do we pray, that this mighty scourge of war may speedily pass away. Yet, if God wills that it continue until the wealth piled by the bondsmen 250 years of unrequited toil shall be sunk, until every drop of blood drawn with the lash shall be paid by another drawn with the sword. As we said 3,000 years ago, so still it must be said, the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. When I was in seminary, I took a class on ethics and the taking of life. I remember Dr. Bland sharing with us that there's no worse kind of war than holy war. Because when you think God is on your side and your cause is divine, then the ends are always justified by the means. Holy wars are the most brutal, the most horrific, because God is doing it with us, right? So it's always a strange mix when we mix God and politics and war. Napoleon Bonaparte, not necessarily a great theologian, but he did his own war making once upon a time. This was his attitude. God is on the side of large battalions. Makes sense. So, when the prophet Isaiah declares in his vision that the one who is one with God will come and bring about justice upon this earth, then what justice was he bringing? If the promised one was not going to get rid of all of Israel's enemies and establish reestablished their prominence in the region. If the promised one was not going to destroy the Roman occupation and reestablish them militarily, economically, and politically, then what justice is God talking about in this passage? And what we see here is that God takes a different twist on justice. Because justice is not so much getting the bad people and making them pay as much as what we do. So listen, listen to the passage. He says, I am the Lord. I have called you in righteousness. I have taken you by the hand and kept you. I have given you as a covenant to the people, a light to the nations. To open the eyes that are blind to bring out the prisoners from the dungeon, from the prison those who sit in darkness. I am the Lord, that is my name. My glory I give to no other, nor my praise to idols. See, four more things have come to pass, and new things I now declare. Before they spring forth, I tell you of them. And we believe that Isaiah was prophesying the coming of Jesus. For I don't think there's been another human being on the planet 
who can more clearly reveal to us God's truest nature. And yet, even when Jesus was on this planet, those closest to him were wondering, are you the one or should we expect another? It happened to John the Baptist, his cousin. You remember the story? Oh, it's a good one. Herod was an immoral man. And John the Baptist, all full of himself, powerful in the wilderness, decided to come to the big city and take on Herod. Herod arrested him, put him in jail. Then one of Herod's stepdaughters did a very sensual dance, and after it was all over, he was just all full of himself. And he said, what, what, would, what do you want? Anything in my kingdom you can have. And her mother whispered in her ear, I want the head of John the Baptist on a silver platter. Yeah, that was John's fate. What justice is there in that? But John, while he was in prison, was concerned that maybe Jesus wasn't getting it and bringing about the justice. John knew his time was short and he needed to see Jesus get on with it. And so John sent some of his disciples to Jesus. And disciples asked Jesus, Jesus, are you the one or should we look for another? And Jesus' response was this, which was taken from this passage in Isaiah. Go back and tell John what you see. I'm opening the eyes of the blind. The lame are walking. Those who are imprisoned are being set free. Go back and tell John so he will know that I am fulfilling the justice that God wants to put on this planet. Now all of a sudden, justice changes. Our perception of what it means in this passage changes. Justice is not so much God smoting those whom we dislike the most because they've done mean things. Justice is not punishing people, but rather how do we serve them, open their eyes, enlighten them, and set them free. How many of you prefer the former kind of justice? Because this one just sounds way too hard. Wouldn't you just much more prefer a good smoting than you having to enlighten, <laughs> nurture, and liberate? Sure. When I was in seminary, my favorite teacher, you all have heard about him before, Max Rogers. We called him the Whispering Prophet. Very skinny man, long bony E.T. fingers. I'm 27 years old. I've got enough seminary education now to make me dangerous. I'm idealistic, and all I need is that damn degree, and I'm going to go out and change the world and make it right for a change, right? Any of you know where I'm talking about? Yeah. Yeah. And one day in our class, I heard Max say, Justice. Justice is a concept created by human beings. And we created justice in this concept because nothing bothers us more than to think that somebody's getting by with something that we weren't able to get by with. And then what he said next was, it's like, boom. I'm, I, I'm in the classroom right now in my mind, and sitting in that desk, I can see everything and everyone around me and see him sitting up front. And this is when he blew me away. In the kingdom of God, there is no justice. <laughs> why? Then why am I on my crusade? Why am I about saving the world and getting rid of everything? Why should I now take the big S off of my chest? In the kingdom of God, there is no justice. There's only love and the love of a cross. And no matter how you try it, no one can ever justify the cross. In the kingdom of God, there is only love. So if you and I want to be on the side 
of God. And we want to be about justice. It's not about our beating the meanies, you know? All those whom we deem as evil and they need to be stopped. We're going to be on the side of God. It means that our life purpose is to be enlightened and to liberate. And as easy as it is to see the need of enlightenment with those sitting around you, the place where we need to start the enlightenment and the liberation is where? And that's your job. You start here. And then as you become enlightened, as you become liberated and set free, then your effectiveness in the world around you will become greater. News to some of you, but not to most. I was abused by my maternal grandfather when I was a child, and it created some great dysfunction in my life. And so I went to a place to find healing. And a part of that healing process was writing down every horrible thing I'd ever thought, every horrible thing that I ever had ever done, and every horrible thing I wanted to do, and write it all down. It took me 10 minutes. No, not really. It took me three days. And I would submit it to my counselor. and said, eh, I think you've got more work to do. <sighs> I looked deeply within myself and became enlightened how I saw myself and how I viewed myself, and much of it was a consequence of how I was abused. And then after I went through that whole process, I had to share it with somebody. And he was a stranger. And line by line and page by page, I went through my list. I knew after I had finished, he was going to throw rocks at my head. So I had my escape plan ready to go. And instead, he smiled and he congratulated me. And he said, you see the Santa Catalina Mountains right over here? I want you to imagine yourself digging a deep, deep hole. Tell me when you're done. I was a fast digger. Yes, I'm done. I want you to put all this in that hole. Okay. And then I want you to cover it up. Let me know when you're done. Okay, I'm done. Never go back to any of this ever again. You are now set free. And a part of the program was that after you had this experience, you did not have to go to your groups and things in the afternoon. You had the rest of the day just to sit and reflect. And this is what happened. I went out there in Tucson, Arizona, and I sat on the ground that topish gray looking dirt and rock and I sat there and for the first time in my life I was present. I smelled the dirt, I smelled the dry bushes around me, I heard the little bug going zzz, 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 zzz. and I had a major revelation. God is not in the past and God is not in the fears of the future but God is in this present moment and for the first time in my life I knew it and experienced it then you'll never believe what happened next. I saw a coyote going across, and I chuckled to myself because about two minutes later, I saw a road runner come the other way. <laughs> and the coyote wasn't chasing the road runner, and the road runner wasn't getting revenge. We were all there in that moment in time, experiencing peace and harmony and the presence of God. And that's the day that justice rained down upon me. So what is justice? What is justice? Justice is not about what we do to bad people, but justice is about enlightening, healing, and liberating. 
so that we can all know the love of this God and make the world a better place for it because we choose to be on the what? Right side of God. Thus ends the lesson. Let us pray. God, I know we have some troubled souls in our midst. People who wage battles with all those around them because they've not waged the battle within themselves. Let us not dwell upon the speck of dust in our brother or sister's eye, but rather let us focus upon the log beam sticking out of our own. And help us to see that the greatest cause we can ever be a part of is the cause of becoming fully conscious and fully connected and becoming one with your spirit. And may we, by the empowerment of your Holy Spirit, may we make this our cause and may we commit ourselves completely to this task so that when we go about the world creating justice we do so like you inspired Jesus to do may we realize that living an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth is stupid and futile. May we remember the words of Mahatma Gandhi when he said, if we lived by that rule, then we would all be blind and toothless. So God, where we are broken, we're looking for healing. Where we are enslaved, we're looking for liberation. And where we are oppressed, we need to be set free. So, healing spirit, come down upon us and help us to see that we have all the resources we need to fulfill this task if we have the commitment to do so. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.